Well, thank you all for coming to the first TAP Colloquium of the year. I'm particularly pleased to see that you all can read email. I knew it started at 345, so awesome. Good job for reading. We're trying to move things a little earlier so that people can get who need to get out of here at 5 will be able to. Um, it's a great pleasure today to uh, welcome Jia Liu, who's going to be uh, giving our first colloquium. Jia received her PhD at uh, Columbia University and is now a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton. She's both an NSF fellow and also works on some things with W first. She works at the intersection of uh, cosmology with a little bit of particle physics thrown in on the side. So I think this should be an exciting talk. So Gia, please take it away. Great. Thank you guys for having me. The weather's been nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start with this picture. Some of you might be familiar with it. <laughs> so this is the Mayan 4 meter telescope. This is a solar telescope. I tried to name all of them, that's impossible. So if you follow the road down, all the way down here, even further, you might not know this telescope very well. This is the MDM telescope. Just again, this is a 4 meter telescope. So back in 2009, I was a business major working in a managerial consulting company, and I got interested in astronomy, and I audited a class in a local university called Columbia University in New York, and then the professor who taught observational astronomy took us on a tour to this cute telescope, 1.3 meter. So I got hooked, and after a few months, I decided to quit astronomy, sorry, to quit business, <laughs> sorry, and then do astronomy. And then since then, I've been coming to um, Tucson to observe many times. Um, but then I turned into a theorist, so I don't come here as much anymore. So this is, yeah, the picture taken when I was first observing here. That was a really memorable week, and I'm super glad, and it's my great pleasure to come back again and to tell you about what I learned since then, okay? <laughs> Massive neutrinos. So let's start with this beautiful chart. This is the standard model of particle physics. Here are the quarks, and here are the leptons, four bosons, and the center is the Higgs boson, who gives mass to particles. In the initial, standard model, neutrino masses were assumed zero in it. Not only because they appear to be zero, very light, and we can't really measure their mass, but also because we only see left-handed neutrinos, and we just don't know how to give particles mass without the right-handed uh, partner through the Higgs mechanism. So they were assumed zero, until there comes the solar neutrino problem. So back in the 1960s, uh, astronomers built the model for solar system, not for the sun, how everything should work for it. And we know how many, um, how bright our sun is, and how the fusion and the fusion uh, works in the center of the sun. So we expect some amount of neutrino coming from the sun towards Earth. However, when particle physicists try to observe the neutrinos, we only see a third of them. Many people were blamed during that time. For astronomers, well, they're not particularly accurate people, so <laughs> losing two thirds is not a big deal, so they probably made a mistake somewhere. For the particle physicists, after all, neutrinos are very hard to detect, so missing some of them probably is something wrong with your instrument, so it's not unexpected as well. So what's the problem? Turns out both astronomers, amazingly, was correct. And also the particle phys physicists were correct as well. What's the problem? The problem is turned out to be at the neutrino. So when the neutrinos, electron neutrinos generate in the center of the sun, and then they pass through the sun and go through this vacuum and arrive on Earth, in this process, the electron neutrinos oscillate back and forth between two other flavors, tau neutrino and the muon neutrino, just like these colors. By the time they reach Earth, two-thirds of them have already oscillated away and become two other flavors, 
That is why we only receive one third of the neutrino on <coughs> Earth. So the discovery of neutrino oscillation tells us that this can only happen if there's a mixing between the neutrino mass eigenstate, nu1, nu2, nu3, they are mixed with the flavor eigenstate, nu e, nu mu, and the nu tau. And that the mass eigenstates must have three different numbers. That means two of them must be massless, massive. And one could be massive, could be massless, we don't know. <coughs> so this discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015 for discovery of neutrino oscillation, which shows that neutrinos have mass. Okay, so now we know they are massive. However, oscillation experiments are only sensitive to the mass square difference. And then through the atmospheric and solar neutrino oscillation, we have only two numbers and we don't have the sign. So we have the mass difference of this, two no this number and another number. And that gives us two ways of arranging the three neutrino masses. One is the normal hierarchy, <coughs> one big mass, two small masses. Or the inverted hierarchy, where two big masses and one little mass. <coughs> However, we still don't know from zero to the lightest neutrino, what is this number? Even with these two numbers, we still can already get something interesting. If we just assume this number is zero, we can have some lower limit for the neutrino masses, which will be 0 0.06 for the normal hierarchy and 0 0.1 for the inverted hierarchy. So two numbers to keep in mind for now. So why do we care, even care about neutrino masses? Isn't that just like three numbers we want to put on standard model charts so we don't embarrass ourselves in front of the students. <laughs> it's not that simple. There's something more interesting than this. So if we put all the fermion masses onto this chart, a range of uh, energies, and we can see here are the six quarks, and here are the familiar tau, muon, and the electron. If we put neutrinos onto this chart, they sit here. So very light, and there's a big gap of six order of magnitude in between them. What's going on? This is making people uncomfortable. And then we start to wonder, is there different mass generation mechanisms for the neutrinos compared to other particles which got their mass from the Higgs mechanism? So this is a question I can't answer, but particle physicists in the audience I know there are some of you maybe can help answer this question. But there are indeed particle physics, uh, physics experiments trying to answer this question by the tritium beta decay experiments. Here you have a tritium, which is just really hydrogen with, with two extra neutrons. And one of the neutron going through the beta decay, and as the result, you have a helium-3 particle here, and the electron here, and the anti-electron neutrino here coming out. So if we can measure the energy distribution of this electron, we can say something about the neutrino. Here is expected energy spectrum for the electron. If the neutrino is massless, we're expected to see the blue curve here. However, if the electron is mass, uh, the neutrino is massive, we expect to see this red curve here. And the difference between them is simply taken away by the rest mass of this neutrino. And this is exactly what people have been doing for a while. So let's look at the current constraint on the neutrino masses. The particle experiment I talked about from beta decay, we have current upper limit of 2 eV. And uh, it's not too far from the lower limit, but there's still some differences. In the next, I would say, 5 to 10 years, we expect to see better constraint from the Katrin experiment, which will have an order of magnitude better constraint, 0.2 eV. And this is their spectrometer. They're trying to carry it through buildings. Very difficult <laughs> task. Um, but I think in June, they started operation already. Please. 
Uh, is it necessarily the case that the empty neutrinos have the same mass as the neutrinos? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Maybe it. Why? Sh why shouldn't it be? Yeah, so we, we want to know first, are they even the same particle, anti-neutrino and neutrino? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. but then maybe they have different, I'm not sure, because the electron and the positron, they have the same mass, so I'm not sure why it wouldn't you, but there might be good reason for that. Yeah, so how about cosmology? Get prepared, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So we have very nice constraints from neutri uh, for neutrino from Planck 2018 result. So from the paper they just published, <coughs> combining Planck CMB and isotropy, CMB lensing and baryonic acoustic oscillation, we have a constraint of 0.12 eV now, which is the order of magnitude better than the particle experiment. And then how about the projected constraint? Combining LST, DESI and CMB S4, the forecast is 0.03 EV. Again, order of magnitude than the projected physical uh, particle physics experiment. So here's LSD. DESI is actually the four meter telescope again. <laughs> so you guys should visit if you haven't. So why is cosmology doing so well in constraining neutrino mass? Uh, and I'm a little bit confused. Yes. The minimum mass that we have is 0.06. Yes. So the lower possible value yeah. would be 0.06. Yes. Yet the upper value is 0.03. Ah, this is the arrow bar. It's the arrow bar of. So if you want to constrain this to, say, 3 sigma, this is what we'll do. So that's the arrow bar you will put on them. Yeah. So you have to have a sensitivity at least this much to see anything <coughs> at all. And then we are really close to. Uh, the lower limit for emerging hierarchy. Yeah. Okay, so why is cosmology so amazing? <laughs> Massive cosmic neutrinos. Sorry, my clicker might die at any, any point, but we'll see. So this is a picture of the history of our universe. Um, from Big Bang to today, you probably show this many times to your student, to the public, but I want to stress two important epoch in this uh, picture. First, the cosmic microwave background. It happened 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It happened because of the photon. They just decoupled from the rest of the hot electron proton soup and free streaming out of um, that hot soup and until they reach us today. That's what we see. However, earlier than the CMB, we also had a similar epoch. Instead of the photons, they were the neutrinos. It happened one second after the Big Bang, cosmic neutrino background. Those were the times that neutrinos free stream out that hot soup of, I'm not sure, quarks or protons and neutrons. And and because the universe expands so fast, they don't have time to interact with anything else anymore. And then they are just free floating around, just like the CMB today. So how about observations? For the CMB, it has been very exciting 30 years in the past. We saw three generations of uh, space satellites from COBE to WMAP to Planck recently. They have revolutionized our understanding of the universe. How about CNU B? Nothing. So why is this? Um, this is a chart of flux as a function of the neutrino energy. So there are the solar neutrinos that I talked about, and then the supernova 9087A that we all know about. And then here are the atmospheric neutrinos that detect by particle experiments and the neutrino from AGN that we hear a lot from the ice cube experiment. They've made uh, exciting news recently. We're actually very good at detecting neutrinos, like for this whole spectrum. However, where's the cosmic neutrinos? They are here. There's a lot of them, more than 10 orders of magnitude than any other neutrino sources. 
The problem with them is that their energy is so low that they simply can't shake the atoms in our detector. That's why we haven't detected them yet. So we can't detect them on Earth. How about just use our universe as the detector? So let's see, how can we do that? So throughout the history of our universe, the structure growth has gone through some dramatic changes. Gone through very early on, our structures or the densities of our universe has been very Gaussian, for example, as the one seen in the cosmic microwave background here. And now what we see is all this, are all these nonlinear structures. This is the galaxy density distribution from the Sloan Sky Digital, Sloan Sky Digital Survey. And you can see this nonlinear structure here maybe halos and the walls and the filaments. They're very different from what they were before. So in this process, massive neutrinos has played non-trivial roles. So there are two major roles they played. One is on the background, one is on the structure growth. So the, for by the background part, if we go back to our Cosmology 101 class, Look at the history of our universe. This is redshift zero today. This is back in time. And redshift thousand, that's where CMB was. So for the three major component in our universe, there's this matter component, radiation component, and dark energy component. Radiation density decays the fastest. And then the next is the matter component. And dark energy is the cosmological constant. So they are constant. So very early on, sorry, I have to change my battery very quick. Yeah, okay, thanks. <clears throat> so very early on, our universe was dominated by the radiation. And later, it became dom matter domination. And now we just entered the dark energy domination epoch. So if we want to think about um, different epochs in terms of growth, structure can only grow during this matter-dominated time because radiation, the pressure was too high, and then during dark energy-dominated time, everything is moving away too fast for things to collapse. So what if we add neutrinos into this picture? So here, the dashed line as for the neutrinos. So in late time, neutrinos are non-relativistic and they behave like matter. That's why this line is parallel to matter. However, earlier in time, neutrinos were relativistic and they behave like radiation and they are more parallel to the radiation curve. So even now today, if we consider neutrinos as matter, in fact, in the past, they behave like radiation. The result is you had more radiation than you would expect, and then as a result, you push this matter radiation epoch, uh, this equality time, to a later time. Hence, you leave less time for the matter domination. And I think this died again. I just <laughs> used the, is there a stick I can use? Yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah, this is much better. It will never die. <laughs> so, ah, this is so much better. <laughs> so in terms of the growth time, you now have much shorter time and the cutoff by the radiation behavior of the neutrinos. <coughs> so that is the first effect. Second effect is the uh, free streaming of the neutrinos. So if we look at gravitational potential well nowadays, this is a big halo. And then for dark matter and the baryons, they have very, like, almost no velocity themselves. They are cold, so they just sink into the center of the potential well. No problem. However, neutrinos, even though they are non-relativistic now, they still have some memory from early times, still have large thermal velocity. So when they go through the potential well, they see it, they slow down a bit, but then fly out again. So even though they are matter, they don't collapse. 
So in this sense, they also erase the small scale structure. So what do we actually see in our universe? This is a simulation of standard model of cosmology. And then you can see that um, you have structure on large scale and small scale. And this cosmology, we have a lot of dark energy, some amount of dark matter, very little of neutrinos. So let's boost the massive neutrino amount and see what happens. This is the result. So on large scale, neutrinos are pretty slow, so they are still clustered, similar to dark matter. But on small scales, you see all these little clumps are now gone, and neutrinos has erased the small scale structure. And that is the signal cosmologists are trying to capture in order to constrain the neutrino mass. Yeah. So exactly how? Let's go to nonlinear cosmology. OK, so now we have this beautiful data from SDSS or from LSSC in the future. Here you are looking at the galaxy distribution. So what do we do with all this beautiful data? You can't just like flip through all the galaxies. It's meaningless. So the natural thing people like to do, uh, it could be meaningful for some people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, not for cosmologists. <laughs> Two-point correlation function is normally <coughs> the thing people go for. What do you do with it? It is really literal. So two point, there are two points. Find one point and then go at x megaparsec away and ask how likely you're going to find a galaxy at both sides of this ruler. And you do this for one galaxy, and two galaxies, three galaxies, until you do for all of the galaxies as a function of the ruler size. And then you can get the matter power spectrum looking like this. So sorry I use uh, in Fourier space, this is just simpler for theoretical reason. But if you are used to real space, just remember small k is large scale, large k is small scale, just flipped. So here is the matter power spectrum. So this is really characteristic peak here. This is, means higher is more clustering at this scale. And when there's smaller power, means there's smaller clustering on this scale. So if you add neutrinos, the matter power spectrum is going to look like that. So for different neutrino mass, this is when I increase the mass of neutrinos. You see on large scale, they are still pretty similar because neutrinos behave like dark matter on large scale. But on small scales, they are free streaming out. And then this is what you see. You have some suppression. This is a bit hard to see because after all, neutrino effect is very small. So we usually do this. We do a ratio of these colored lines over this massless curve. This is what you end up seeing. So this is smaller mass, larger, larger, and even larger. So as you increase the mass of the neutrinos, you see a larger suppression. And then it's larger towards small scales. So that is exactly what I showed you in this simulation comparison. For massless and massive neutrino simulations, on large scale, they're very similar. But on small scale is what distinguishes them. So everyone is conv conv convinced that this is a nice method to go. And uh, we're all set to find neutrino masses. <laughs> Except for this, yeah, of course, this is not entirely correct. Because this makes very big assumption of the structure growth is very small, which is linear, they say. Which is not true, because we see all these galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and they're not small fluctuations, they're very big fluctuations in our universe, and there are nonlinear growth happening in our universe. <coughs> and this curve, the dash curve, is if you include those nonlinear growth in your calculation, and you can see that large scale, they're very linear, so we're fine with those scales. But on small scale, there's a boost of power, more clustering, more bigger halos than if we use the linear theory. And not only the power spectrum is wrong, the difference, the ratio of them is also wrong, that 
The solid curve is from linear theory, and dash curve is from the nonlinear theory. You see there's some difference. If we don't capture this difference, model them correctly, we'll get a wrong answer for the neutrino mass. We don't want to embarrass ourselves. <laughs> okay? So fine, we'll just use the nonlinear power spectrum. Okay? Except for even worse, the nonlinear power spectrum is still insufficient. It's not capturing all the information still. I'm gonna demonstrate this um, with the millennial simulation. So this, everyone's familiar with, kind of, yeah? So I just picked the simulation that's uh, somewhat famous. So uh, we can play with this. So next, I'm gonna do a test with you guys, and I don't want to just lecture you guys, I want you to convince yourself. So here, there are two images. One is the real simulation. Another is a Gaussian random field with exactly the same power spectrum, nonlinear power spectrum as the simulation. Uh, so except, except now I filtered all the small scale, so I cut off at 50 megaparsec. All the information is gone on small scale, that's why they look so fuzzy. Can anyone tell me <coughs> which one is the real simulation? This one? Or this one? This one, you think? Okay, can, can you just raise your hand? This one? <laughs> what is bright and what is dark? Ah, so sorry. Bright is um, over density. Dark is under density. So can we guess? Do you think it's this one? Yeah, okay, few people. How about this one? Bit more people? Okay, so it's ambiguous. Now I will give you a bit more information. Now it's smooth at 20 megaparsec. This one? This one? Is that the real that you're asking? Oh yeah, so the, the real, which one is the real universe? One on the this one? Yeah. One on the left? <laughs> Why you think so? Well, from the smoothing on the right, the extra smoothing. No, they're smooth at the same scale, and then they have the same, I'm showing you the power spectrum here. They have the exact right. same power spectrum. Well, there's a problem because you're smoothing on a scale similar to your box size, but mm -hmm. by eye, what mm -hmm. you're asking us to do, that looks to be smoother for me on the right than mm -hmm. the true. Let's see. Okay, so let's just go to the next one. <laughs> so now I give you more information. Is this clear now which one is the real one? <laughs> this one? The left one? Okay, this one? Still some people think it's this one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm not trying to be so dismissive. I encourage guesses. <laughs> okay. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so now you, you can see that we're really entered the nonlinear regime. That even though they're both nonlinear power spectrum, even by eye you can see the difference. But with power spectrum, you can't tell the difference between them. And finally, I'll just give you the full image. That's the, this two, they have exact the same power spectrum. But you have convinced yourself that they're different. So that is the information lost in the two-point correlation function. Okay? So why is there more information? That's the next question uh, I want to answer. So let's imagine a universe with two type of fluctuation. One is the short wavelengths, and then one with the long wavelengths mode. That's just the fluctuation size. And let's just put them on top of each other for simplicity. So in a universe, um, that different modes or different size of fluctuation, they fluctuate, they evolve separately. This is what we're gonna see, that they just don't care about each other's existence. So if we put observer here in the over dense region in terms of the blue curve or under dense region here, we ask, what is the power of this red curve? And they will give me the same answer. They don't care where they are. However, in real universe, this is more of what's happening. 
observer A is sitting on the hill of the over dense region that um, when they see this short wavelength mode, they see a boost of the power. And then when you're sitting in the void, they see a suppression of this power. You are no longer independent of other wavelengths. So this is the reason we see this non-Gaussianity in the lensing map I showed you early, or in, in the matter density map I showed you earlier. So I told you I come from the business background. There's a good analogy for this, which is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that's happening with our universe as well. And we need to solve this problem. <laughs> And we solve this problem with massive new simulation. We hope, we try. So the massive new simulation, it's cosmological, massive neutrino simulations. And then with the font, I found because they move very fast. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they are 100 cosmological models uh, run with uh, embodied simulation called Gadget. And we capture the full nonlinear evolution in massive neutrino cosmology. Here are the 100 models. In all the models, we vary three cosmological parameters, the total mass of neutrinos, omega m, the matter density in our universe, and the A sub s. This is the initial matter power spectrum from early universe, and that is the amplitude for the power spectrum. We pick these two other parameters because they are very degenerate with the neutrino mass and then we want to see how we can break the degeneracy um, using the simulation. So one note I want to make is that all the data is public, including galaxy lensing and CMB lensing maps, and the halo catalog, merger trees, and the snapshots, they're available here, Columbia Lensing, the org, and the codes used are here. So feel free to download yourself and play around, and if you have any questions, you can ask me, email me, and the code paper is there. So there are many people involved in this project, it's not just myself. So <coughs> there are three rows of people, I arranged them for a reason. The bottom rows are the faculty involved or people who went to bank after, all, after <laughs> graduate. <laughs> so we call these people, people with a job. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the next row are the then postdocs, some of them become faculty, some of become a faculty. And then this row are the postdocs, always took on too many projects than they can actually have time for. So, and then the top row are the uh, workforce for this project. They're the students, and they worked on different aspects of massive neutrinos, and they are the truly amazing people in this project. And I'll highlight three projects today, the peak counts, the voids, and the bispectrum. So now we move on to the next step that I hope I already convinced you that there's a lot of information beyond the two-point correlation function or the power spectrum. And how do we get them is, uh, is my interest and is the goal of our current work. So I already told you about the two-point correlation function. It's great because uh, we can model them and it's really transparent, all the physics go into it. So people are very comfortable with it. And there are a lot of code already tested for this and all the systematics are really well studied for this. So that is why it's very popular. But now we know there's information beyond it. What do we do? The natural thing is one, two, Three, and now we go to the three-point correlation function. <laughs> so instead of dropping rulers in your map and measure how many galaxies you can count, now you drop triangles. You see a galaxy here, and you drop a triangle of whatever shape you want, and you ask how likely you're going to find another galaxy at these two corners of this triangle. So this is uh, work led by Will Corden. He was at uh, Princeton, but now he's a postdoc at uh, Cambridge. And so he looked at triangles of all kinds of shape. I want to just show you two uh, very interesting shapes. This is the equilateral shape looking like this. 
So it's pretty much just a function of one scale. It's the size of uh, this leg. And what I'm showing you here is a bit messy, but let me go over. So there are two groups of um, two colors. This is redshift, I think, two. This is redshift one. So you already see that there's an evolution of matter power or bispectrum as a function of redshift. The second thing I want to point out is this curve, solid curve, is massive, massless neutrino. Dash curve is uh, massive neutrino. So you already see there's some suppression by the neutrino mass, very similar to the power spectrum. However, if we go to a different shape, next I want to show you the squeeze limit where you have one really short leg and two long legs. Those are probing small scale fluctuation that is in response to the large scale fluctuation. So this is lost in the power spectrum. And you first you can notice that there are again two groups of uh, curves, again different redshift and you see an evolution of them. However, just look at the tilt. This is tilting down very similar to the matter power spectrum I showed you. And this is going up. So this is showing for, for this squeeze limit, you are seeing more and more response from the small scale to the large scale mode that we have. And again, you see this is the massless neutrino case and the massive neutrino case. And there is a suppression again here. And we're hoping to use this signature to help constrain the neutrino mass. So this is uh, what <coughs> cosmologists like to see, mm -hmm. the contours. Um, what I want to, I don't want to go over each panel, but this is maybe most interesting for now. This is A sub S, the power spectral amplitude for primordial power spectral amplitude. And this is neutrino mass. So if you don't do cosmology, just remember, smaller, the better. So here, we're looking at um, this curve. The blue curve is from the power spectrum. The black curve is from the bispectrum. So this is very exciting already, that bispectrum on its own already can have a comparable constraint as the power spectrum. And then if you notice that they are very similar, but slightly tilted, because they have a slightly different dependence on the parameters, these two parameters. That is why when we join these two constraints together, you see a smaller contour here. So this is saying that with the same cost, observing the same amount of galaxies, by just simply counting triangles, we can gain some extra free information here. OK, this is very exciting. And the next thing we're trying to do is just to test uh, all the systematic involved, just like people did for the power spectrum. So the natural thing after the bispectrum normally will be, I don't know what it's even called, it's not squares, but four legs. Uh, tri-spectrum and quartz, I, I don't even know the names. You just go to higher and higher orders of um, shapes and trying to do the same to get more information. The problem is there's just so many possible shapes once you go up one more level. And then they become so noisy that you can't measure them anymore. So that's why people start to look into summary statistics. And I want to talk about weak lensing peak counts. So this is one particular popular statistic people have been using and have applied to real data. So peak counts, it is very literal. Count the peaks in your map. So this is um, typically done with weak lensing, but we can just think of it as a 2D projection of a 3D density map. Peaks are these regions. In the map, they are the pixels with higher value than the surrounding pixels. And then what they are related to physically are the really highly nonlinear regions, probably halos in our universe. So if you still remember the simulation I showed you, one 
uh, with neutrino one without neutrino. On large scale, they are very similar, but it's on a small nonlinear scale that's the most distinguishing feature. So this is work done with uh, Zach Lee from Princeton, a graduate student there. And he looked into peak counts uh, of the mass and mu simulation. So again, this is a power spectrum, except for now we're doing 2D power spectrum. And then blacker is mass, uh, it's a fiducial cosmology. And there on top of it, there are three different models changing the three parameters I mentioned, neutrino mass, omega m, and a sub s. And this is the ratio plot. So one is the same, and the difference, three different curves is when we change the parameter by some amount. We can see that when you change parameters, the change in these three curves look very similar. It seems like just moving things up and down. This is also ex ex explaining why these three param parameters are very degenerate meaning neutrinos can suppress the power spectrum, but then other two parameters can just mimic the neutrino signature. How about peak counts? So earlier I showed you different uh, peaks in the map, and then if we make a histogram of it as a function of their height, this is what it looks like. So here are corresponding to the large halos in the universe, here are the smaller halos or potentially walls and filaments in the universe. And then, however, if you change the three different parameters, you see a stretching of this. You have a suppression for the high peak and low peak, and then you see a boost of the medium peaks. So this signature is very different from the power spectrum. And we're hoping to use this different signature to combine with power spectrum and constrain the neutrino mass better. And again, the contour plot showing, let's just focus on the lower panel again. This blue curve is from the power spectrum, and the peak counts is here. Isn't this amazing? Because if you remember earlier, the phi spectrum has similar shape as the power spectrum. But then here, peak counts, which is very simple, can already do so well here. And then when you combine these two together, you see that it's pretty much overlapping with peak counts because peak counts already is very tightly do, um, constrained. Okay, so this is very exciting, and actually, people <coughs> have already put. Pe please. Can I come back to the previous slide? Please? Yeah. So I did just kind of uh, the fact that you're not doing log scale because all these outrage is just very small scale. Mm -hmm. And if you're only small scale, that's true. It's you know, just do an uh, up and down. Yeah. But one 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 thing that you have at, at in the future is large area, mm -hmm. which means that we can maybe go to scales where we can immediately see the shape of the the, the power spectrum you know, because the, the regions where neutrinos do uh, um, behave like dark matter, and we could see see the transition itself. Uh, on large scale, I expect them have no not much impact. Also. In fact, there is some signature. Yeah, it's really point. hard to if see. If yeah. they don't have an impact at, at that's right. large yeah, scales, yeah. but they do have an impact in small scales, then there's a shape dependence. And that's right. Yeah. Yes, for example, and omega matter just change the power spectrum as an amplitude everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Thank you for pointing it out. Yes. Okay. So, back to peak counts here. We know it has good constraints. And people actually have already done this on data. For DES science verification data, people measure. Um, this is the measured peak counts, the blue dots. And then in the background, all these curves, they are theoretical predictions with different cosmological parameters. Here they use uh, omega m and the sigma a. This is the magic fluctuation. And then you can see that there is already a significant signature from just a random distribution of peaks. And again, this is just showing you uh, the same technique has been applied for to the KIDS survey recently. And also in the past, we did for the CFHE lens and other surveys. And people also translated this into cosmological constraints. 
Yeah, I won't go to the detail, but all you can, you need to see is power spectrum and the peak counts. Again, the power spectrum, green one, <coughs> peak counts is the blue one. Here, the power spectrum is the shaded one, and the peak counts is this uh, blue curve. So they are all very similar in size and could potentially even be better. So even with data, we have already shown that peak counts is very powerful. Quick question. Yes. With these peak counts, I mean, if you if you double the number of particles in your simulation, mm -hmm. somehow resolve smaller scales. Mm -hmm. Don't you expect like more peaks? If you keep result, you know, getting more and more particles in your in body simulation, to yes. get more and more and more peaks. So you, yes, you eventually, that? if you can push down to small scale, you have more and more information. However, in reality, you have no noise from galaxy shapes. So we have looked at pushing to smaller scale. We found um, that if you go down to say two arc minute with the LSST like noise, it's swamped by noise. You can't get out any information anymore. In idealized simulation, yes, you can get a lot. Yeah, I guess I'm maybe not asking the right question. For the power spectrum, you expect that when you add more particles, you are, are you counting peaks in each? Yeah, I guess you're counting peaks per scale. Right? Mm -hmm, yes. That's what I'm. Yeah, yeah. Thinking. Yeah, yeah, peak counts is a function of scale. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, combining different scale, you get different structure yeah, and even more. Yeah. yeah, great. Uh, so last thing I want to mention is uh, opposite of peaks, cosmic voids. So they are the emptiest regions in our universe, like all these regions. They are also less explored in theory. So I just want to quickly show one plot from a recent paper by Christina Crash and Alicia Pisani from Princeton. And they led a work uh, using two simulations, the demo new simulation and the massive new simulation that I mentioned. So this is the halo, uh, sorry, not halo mass function, void count function as a function of void size. The black curve is massless neutrino, and the progressively you increase the neutrino mass and you see a suppression in this end and a boost in this end. So the lower panel is easier to see, that's the ratio uh, over the massless case. And for large voids, you see less of them, and for small voids, you see more of them because of massive neutrinos. Does this make sense? So I think I understand what the peaks were, but what's your definition of Voids, so that's a great question. So for peaks, you just go look for halos, and here's one, here's another one, they're typically spherical. However, for voids, there are people defined as just empty region as you go out and the spherical region until you, find, you, you don't hit a wall. But then the void finder we're using is wide, and it can be any shape as long as you don't hit a wall. It's more complicated, and I think it's like another whole talk, and I'm not expert on void myself to answer that, but I think that's the debate among void people. <coughs> well, let me ask, yeah. is it, does it have to be completely empty, or is it just a contrast? I think it's a contrast. So the simplest thing to do is just say, you do a density, a pixelized density map, and you have a cut, and whatever made into that cut that's lower than that density, you call them a void. So these statistics as you're calculating them are applied to the simulations, yes. but how do you then translate them into the observational space? Because you said you're comparing with data, Yes. and the data has projection effects, it has lensing effects. Yes. What, what happens from this to that? So what we did with peak counts is we actually do ray tracing simulations, and then we actually place the realistic galaxy to the observed redshift and put uh, actual galaxy shape noise into them. So that included everything. However, for ways we have not translated <coughs> into observation. We don't know yet how to do this. Okay, so when you showed us with the peak counts before, yeah. the distinction between different models yeah. derived from different neutrino masses, yeah. that included your estimates of the sources of observational That's source. right. So we we looked at S LSSC science book um, and then look at the source distribution and then the number counts of galaxies and then we put it all into our simulation. So we did a forward modeling of everything. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. No problem. So for our cosmic wars, <coughs> now it's very interesting. Um, what we think is happening is when you have massless neutrino, there's more growth. So imagine all the material just flow into the potential well. Now you have a really big empty void. Everything went out to some halos. However, in massive neutrino case, the growth is smaller, meaning there's still leftover material in your voice that has not gone into the halos next door yet. So they're still sitting in the middle of your void and potentially just cut your voids in half, become two smaller voids. That is why we see a suppression of big voids, and then as a result, they get split up into smaller voids. One void from two smaller voids because of the seven neutrino mass. Yes, so there's more complication because we don't, this is done for dark matter particles. We don't observe them, we observe halos. So there's even more complication. How do you translate from halo observed void into <coughs> dark matter voids? Well, the, deep, the dark energy survey has done two D max, two, two D cleansing. Yes. So, you know, in the sense that we, we can have a two D. We can have, but those are not voids anymore. They are troughs. I think Elizabeth may know this better. Like there's a big discussion. When you see a lensing map, it's like a trough that you're looking at. And then voids are very easily dis uh, disrupted because any halo superposition uh, from with the voids, you will destroy that voids. But the halos does not get destroyed because of lensing. So yeah, that's more complication for that. Okay. So I mentioned a few things and I won't, yeah, I see you guys are yawning, so I understand I should <laughs> shut up now. <laughs> so there are more interesting probes, Minkowski functionals, one point PDF moments, I can go on and have three more colloquiums here. But uh, the bottom line is there's rich information beyond the two point statistic that we are missing if we just use the power spectrum. And I want to just conclude here one is massive neutrino suppress the growth of structure. Two, there's massive new simulation. Data is public. Please take a look at them if you're interested. And three, there's rich information in the density field that we should explore and do not let them waste. And thank you for your attention. Uh, so when you, you say implementation like particle neutrino or linear theory neutrino or is that what you mean? Yeah, or literally painting them onto a grid in the sim rather than evolving their trajectories or anything like that. What do you mean painting neutrinos? I, I'm not uh, sure if people so do that. Some people use um, just, uh, just treating the neutrinos as a field rather than... Uh, okay. So I think there are two different things people are trying to do. One is just treating them as a background field, like you right. said, that's like linear, uh, evolve them linearly. Another is actually treating them with as a particle that gravitates. So the problem with this two method, the particle method, is they have a lot of short noise, so it's extremely expensive. And uh, the method we use is the linear theory method that is very cheap. Um, they got the matter power spectrum correct, but then neutrino power spectrum a little bit off, like less suppression because it's linear theory. Um, but we have now developed the hybrid method that we treat neutrinos as linear theory early on because they are just very little clustering. And later on, we turn them into particles mm -hmm. and then we capture the full nonlinear evolution. But you turn everyone or just the just the distribution where they're slow? Yeah, just the slow ones. Good cash, yeah. So I have maybe a silly question about image statistics. And I'm wondering if you could put up that picture of all of your collaborators again. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. So one of the things we know about snapshots like this yeah. is that they all have the same power spectrum, <laughs> even though you know you can instantly recognize these people that you work with. Uh -huh. And the thing that's relevant with all the maps, these pretty things, is the phase information. Uh -huh. And you can do great violence to the amplitudes in an image, but the phase preserves the patterns that you recognize and allows you to discriminate in very, very different images and you could do that you know just discard the phases of all these snapshots uh -huh. and you still recognize or discard the uh, amplitudes you would yeah. still recognize by phase mm -hmm. and so i'm always wondering why people looking at cosmological simulations mm -hmm. do not focus on the property of the phases particularly when you get out of the mountain gaussian case that you're mm -hmm. you're talking about that's where the stuff really comes into play the phases exactly what do you mean the relation, the phases are the, are the well, it's, it's a property of the Fourier amplitudes. Uh -huh. When you take a, uh, it tells you how the information is positioned uh -huh. relative to each other in the picture. When you take a power spectrum, the first thing you do is discard all the phases. You simply throw them out. That is exactly <laughs> not Gaussian information we're talking about here, the phases, that you correlate this pixel with two other pixels. Yes, but there's so too many pixels that you need to keep that it becomes really hard to model. And I entirely agree with you, phase makes a lot of difference, yes. Um, so, okay, Evan has a question. Can you go to the plot of the power spectrum? Which one? The power spectrum. The mat, uh, P matter? Yeah. This one? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I can understand from large scale structures, even if they have neutrinos, there is not much difference. Mm -hmm. But if you see at a small scale, mm -hmm. the more massive you have, mm -hmm. uh, the power spectrum is coming down, right? Yeah. Uh, but the question is, so if you have it at a small scale, if, if, it, if the neutrinos are more massive, they mm -hmm. usually capture it at a small scale, right? I mean, because ah, okay. Them. I think this is a question you, uh, <laughs> like maybe Kaylin asked when I last time told her about this. Uh, it depends on how you define mass. Omega m, if you include neutrinos into them, that's it. That is telling you how much cold dark matter you are missing. So, oh. yeah. So you are thinking of like yeah. you have the same amount of cold dark matter that you have extra. Have yeah. If you turn uh, turn photons into neutrinos, that will happen. Like what you said, there will be more suppression, uh, more more clustering. Yeah. yeah. So that's the definition confusion. Yes. Uh, so, you gave a constraint for how well that the next generation of surveys in astronomy will uh, constrain the sum of the neutrino masses. Yeah. Was that just using two point statistics, or was that using all of the various techniques? Two points. Okay. Yeah. So, we could expect something even better than that. Then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, the expression of void volume is due to uh, different cities of the loss or due to the absence of smaller dark matter halos uh, in the world. You mean the suppression? What is you mean here? Sorry. Uh, the suppression of void volume. Uh, in the voice part, uh, plot part? Yes. So this one? This one? Yes. So you have uh, this suppression? Yes, the suppression is due to the signi different signals of the walls mm -hmm. or due to the absence of smaller dark matter halos in your simulation. Uh, this one I have not, we have not checked exactly okay. how it worked, yeah. But we have not checked like how exact the shape change. Are we just losing voids altogether or we're just like changing them into smaller voids? So yeah, that's something but, we want but, to But you have the three of the edit bodies, so when two other bodies is the same initial condition, you could see the way if what we're missing are uh, the void, uh, if the voids are just not growing, or you actually have a different way of forming. On our to-do list, thank you. <laughs> it's on our to-do list, yes. Right, so one, last, one last question? Uh, yeah. Sure, yeah, see, so you, you showed the, you made the thought as if you put random phases on the power spectrum, you don't reproduce an image very well yes. at small scales. So if you take the bispectrum, mm -hmm. is it even possible to randomly create an image from a bispectrum? I, yeah, that's uh, like for power spectrum, you can generate Gaussian random field, but I don't know how to generate random. If 
by a spectrum yeah. field yeah, constrained by a spectrum. I'm not sure maybe someone else know this. Yeah, I also also wonder the same. If I just tell you the PDF is this, can you generate an image that matches it? Because oh, yeah. no, it wouldn't match, but it would. We are basically at time, so um, <laughs> Gia is going to be here up and we'll be happy to answer, I think, a few more yeah. questions, but let's thank her for an excellent talk. <laughs>